Hello, everyone. Ian Ramsdale with Cooperos here. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Ed Wires from Prepare for Flight. Uh, we're here to discuss Cooperos's uh, uh, filaments and NASA's enthusiasm for using ex exotic filaments in their added manufacturing program, uh, as well as covering uh, the unique benefits of uh, added manufacturing for NASA, embedded circuits in spacecraft, and different use cases. Uh, you know, especially with uh, Cooperos's. Uh, R&D path for formulas for our uh, future filaments. So Ed, right. thank you for uh, thank you for joining me, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. So Ed, uh, first uh, I'd like to bring up uh, you know what's what's the importance of added manufacturing in aerospace currently? Okay, well Ian, thank you for having me today. Uh, I wanted to first uh, mention a little bit about my background. Uh, so folks can see uh, where my unique perspective is on this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, just I've got relevant background. Uh, so uh, I'm a contractor at NASA Goddard. I work in the radiation effects and analysis group. I'm also the founder and CEO of Prepared for Flight, which is an idea development and uh, domestic manufacturing collective. So through both of those programs, I am with NASA's working group on non-metallic uh, additive manufacturing materials which funny thing being that uh, Cooper's technology falls into some of those materials extrusion categories uh, just because of some of its unique properties uh, and then I'm also an ASME's working group under the same topic and then through prepared for flight uh, we have over 30 uh, different 3d printers uh, a lot of uh, a fused uh, filament fabrication as well as the uh, SLA and the UV type so we're, we're uh, quite a quite uh, situ situated within the, the additive manufacturing industry here. It, so, in, yeah. It well, sounds like uh, you're, you're definitely got your uh, foot and, and uh, toehold in the industry and have a lot of knowledge in it. And uh, yeah, no, thank you for explaining uh, your expertise that uh, helps us uh, understand uh, that you're not just some joker I found off the street to come in and have a conversation. So uh, well, I do appreciate that. So let me answer your question here. So additive manufacturing has begun to revolutionize much of the aerospace design and manufacturing paradigm. In other words, well-defined legacy manufacturing processes may not be superior to some of these leading edge commercial processes like additive manufacturing. You know, 3D printing is usually the, the colloquial term for that. So even though there's the old processes have flight heritage, we've got quite a lot of data, statistics, you know, a lot of the new processes don't necessarily. So it's very hard for a seasoned uh, technologist to rationalize replacing some of those legacy processes that historically work. So the problem is that, you know, on the other hand, recent experience in a lot of these other markets and industry uh, have definitely bolstered the evidence that quality goods can be made with minimum time and resources, and that can be done domestically and it can definitely drastically cut down on lead times. So what the, makes these tools especially powerful is the advanced material sets that exhibit advanced compatibility, increased performance, and those are gonna be the cornerstone of a successful additive manufacturing process and subsequent manufacturing production plans. So materials such as Kubros's CU-29, you know, which are said to be replacements to what we'd call legacy technology, are those gatekeepers to wider adoption of additive manufacturing techniques? Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Uh, in added manufacturing, uh, there, there's a lot of key points to it that uh, make it much more beneficial to reduction manufacturing. And so uh, you see the ability to save weight as uh, well as materials to be a, a strong driving force in why uh, Added manufacturing is coming into the manufacturing, but what impacts do you think uh, added manufacturing has to the manufacturing processes currently? Well, Ian, uh, Prepare for Flight is very familiar with the the manual way of doing things. Uh, in prototyping, uh, you know, sometimes we'll use automated procedures, either things that we've made internally, or you know, we'll use some commercial off-the-shelf 3D printers. So, with the old way of fabricating, you know, you're cutting away materials. Uh, maybe you're doing a casting where you've had to cut away parts of that mold in order to facilitate that procedure. So the process of building parts incrementally, layer by layer, it does reduce cost because you don't have materials waste. Okay, It enables new designs where before 
if something was too complex, you couldn't actually make a mold for it, or the mold was so complex that the cost became uh, so misproportional that you know you didn't perform that work. You know, it was a non-starter. So there are challenges here. You know, to the order of traditional uh, aerospace hardware development cycles uh, that you know can be overcome with additive manufacturing. So for existing designs, for example, uh, additive manufacturing offers unique abilities to substantially reduce the cost of manufacturing of that complex hardware, particularly when we're doing limited quantities. So very common to space flight applications. You know, NASA, uh, we're building one, maybe two of an item, and that's it. We go to launch it, We've got a 10 or a 25 year design cycle. Same thing goes in a lot of aerospace applications. These aren't quick commodities that we're producing millions of, you know, with good statistics and, you know, whatever the reliability figures need to be with that. These are very highly advanced, high reliability systems. So for that type of thing, we only need to build one. If we've got great design engineers, we can invent a new component. We can then create it out of thin air with one of these printers, and then we can do the test and verification that we have in legacy processes to make sure it does add up to what we expect. You know, and that's just standard good engineering practice. So with the advent of additive manufacturing processing, prototype hardware designs will be iterated with very minimum cost and very minimum impact to schedule, because in the time that it would take to say, outsource to have a CNC machine cut away at some you know metal that could take two or three weeks lead time with additive manufacturing you might be able to pr produce a new part or two every single business day and then be able to evaluate 10 different iterations of your idea by the time you even get the machine one back in house so to do all this with incremental development of uh, aerospace systems yeah, I, I think it's going to be definitely a bonus for any engineer that's able to bring this capability in house. Um, just alone, uh, I've seen the ability for rapid prototyping by uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, etc. Uh, I remember seeing a, a company once; uh, they found a three D printer at their library that they were able to use for their first mock up prototype for their uh, business idea. So uh, it's definitely out there, and it's uh, very helpful, especially in those instances, like you said, to keep the lead time down. Um, so uh, with the aerospace industry, what's it doing right now that's keeping added manufacturing in the forefront? Okay. Well, one of the biggest opportunities here for federal and commercial space industry is, you know, as I mentioned previously, it's to reduce cost and schedule, but it also is enabling new mission capabilities for space exploration or for advanced aeronautical uh, applications. So 3D printing allows for the faster and the more efficient creation of many varieties of parts with complex geometries or you know performance features that we don't have i mean the best example there is years ago we didn't have aerogel and now we do and, and folks can look up that on the side there's no need for me to explain it here so what nasa has done as i said a little bit of the introduction about myself is uh, we've published two technical standards it's nasa standard 6030 and NASA standards 6033. And these provide the agency with a framework for advanced additive manufacturing programs and for the development and manufacture of hardware produced using additive manufacturing technologies. In other words, we put together the framework to help folks qualify an additive manufacturing process, much like you would with anything else we've done historically. So you can actually do that comparison for throughput, for cost, for practicality. So uh, while I continue to speak here from the perspective of the aerospace community, I did mention before with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers or ASMA, they've also launched a similar set of working groups to identify gaps in additive manufacturing standards, some of those documents. So NASA and them have done some work in parallel here. Uh, but they have managed to uh, capture a lot of the best practices from a lot of us uh, in industry who are practitioners. And then they're able to, through documents, uh, provide guidance back to the present and new users of additive manufacturing processes. Yeah, um, the it's really interesting because these standards that we talk about, I mean, uh, they're, they're very vital in aerospace because uh, especially when you're sending uh, any, any uh, 
satellites or craft into space because it's not like you're actually going to end up uh, being able to send a technician up there to repair it very easily. So uh, I can yeah. understand why those st standards are very important. So uh, thank you. Um, but, you know, we're now, we've evolved in the last, uh, you know, 20 years, we're a data-driven economy now. There's so much data available to all these businesses and everything out there and this in their, uh, you know, key performance indicators and stuff like that. What types of improvements to a company's K K KPIs and data can they expect to gain from uh, ad manufacturing and 3D printing? Okay, so some of the things we track as those uh, KPI or key process or performance indicators. Uh, so for specifically the, the food process tech, which is a uh, you know, fused filament fabrication or triple F, here are the things we focus on. So mainly when we buy a product or we're putting it into action, we're looking at dimensional accuracy, both before and after the print. Now, what is being sliced? Is that actually what we're getting out of the printer? We're looking at thermal stability of the material. So as it melts, as it stays in liquidus. So those are terminology you usually hear when we're talking about uh, electrical circuit board manufacturing, doing a solder reflow process, okay? Uh, for you know, conductive filaments, we're looking at what the electrical performance is, and then not just at room temperature, but over an application range of temperatures, waiting for the board to soak at a cold temperature or soak at a hot temperature, and then reading some of those measurements back. And then having said thermal, we also look at mechanical performance or mechanical compliance. So interfaces of those materials, maybe the substrate or an overlay, or how they before, uh, perform over that temperature range or thermal cycling. Will they delaminate? Uh, will they become brittle? Will they, will they fall apart? And then from an extension of that becomes environmental response. So in, uh, for NASA, for instance, uh, when we put things in outer space, there's a vacuum up there, there's no air. So what happens with the material, say in a vacuum, does it outgas? Will it immediately fall apart or implode? You know, what happens if we subject it to humidity? You know, th these are the types of things that we're able to track with additive manufacturing because the material itself provided by you guys, the vendors and the, the you know, uh, the inventors of the material and these material systems, you know, you're able to characterize it so thoroughly that we don't even have to do that work anymore. I know years in the past, we'd have to bring a material in house and put together a qualification plan in order to see if it met the data sheets. And more often than not, additive manufacturing materials are what they say they are. And through minimum optimization of a printer, you know, we're up and running in a few hours. And that's never been the case before. So in, in general, the, the unique strengths of the additive manufacturing process, they've motivated the space flight industry to lead in the application of additive manufacturing technologies with the greatest challenge associated with the implementation in AM and aerospace systems. It doesn't lie in the, the changing of the paradigms, but it lies on the safe implementation of a new and rapidly changing technology. So compared to the most material processes, you know, the brevity and the timeline with AM implementation from the invention to the commercialization to critical ap application is unprecedented at the speeds we're able to work here. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned delamination. That was one of the real exciting aspects of Cooper's technology from early testing was that we, uh, we were able to thermocycle our first electron, uh, electrical traces to the point of failure and we didn't have any delamination from the underlying material. And uh, our preliminary testings for other materials showed uh, strong adhesion to it as well. So we're excited to see those capabilities uh, when, when, when we launch. So, um, so uh, the transition for, to added manufacturing right now in circuit board processes, there's been a lot of talk about 3D printed electronics. We have a lot of competitors out there claiming things from nano uh, uh, technologies to complex electronics, et cetera. So um, what, what do you, uh, where do you feel the transition for AM to circuit board processes specifically going? Well, uh, I for one am, am very familiar with the old way of doing things. So circuit board processes, circuit board assemblies, uh, all these uh, legacy processes that are done largely offshore. And when it comes down to it, it's literally just copper clad FR4, which is a flame retardant plastic. And that's the industry standard for circuit boards. But it gro grossly has its limitations in the prototyping world. We know this at NASA, 
We know these at our industry partners, and we know this at Prepare for Flight. It's all about planarity, and that's the heartbreaker of successful cuts. So the community of practice has realized that there is an art form behind using a computer-controlled mill. It doesn't matter how fine-tuned that is. If the material you're putting in isn't as rigid as you would expect or isn't as flat as it's supposed to be, it's just going to end up having problems. The second thing there is that even with a perfectly leveled machine and that smooth motion system, no operator can prevent a bit from crashing into the workpiece, a, a burr from remaining along a cut trace, or no mouse bites from happening within that trace itself. So those are all problems associated with subtractive manufacturing. You have wear and tear on your tools, no getting away from that. 3D printers don't seem to have that issue. If you know anyone's surprised there, I figure that one's obvious. We're just making a material molten and we're doing very fine control to put that material where we need it. So with most things, you've got vibration and resonance, tool wear and degrade, uh, degradation, uh, laminated materials have their own tolerances. Even with laser ablation, which some folks say is, is the end all be all of tooling uh, processes, there's an overcut called the kerf, which most people don't even think about. So there's only a certain level of fine pitch that you can accomplish with even a laser tool. So triple F processes, they eliminate most of these things. So why not use it? I mean, that, that's my thought and belief anyway. So further benefits of triple F and aerospace labs, which by definition are usually electronics labs, is that there are no, usually no additional requirements, uh, you know, to have a multiple ed uh, chemical etchants, adhesions, you know, adhesives, uh, coatings, post processes, you know, with something such as, you know, the, the CU-29, you know, you can store your filament in the sealed desiccant bag, you, have, you can have a fully self-contained printer dealing with your air filtration. You can have multiple independent tool heads or, you know, extruders. You can have a mixing extruder. And then most of that, it covers 95% of the applications we need. So why do you really need to buy a proprietary printer? So and that's largely the problem with some of these uh, highly proprietary exotic material systems. You buy the material, but in order to use the material, you need to buy the expensive printer as well. And that requires multiple years of paperwork when it comes to federal spending. There's got to be a really good justification and that material can have, you know, it needs to have unique properties that nothing else in the market's going to be able to do. And I'll tell you what, it's very hard to justify those purchases. So with something like this, you know, if the space community can procure a wide selection of materials from what I'll call expert vendors, then we can focus our efforts on exploring those materials rather than training staff to use an assortment of different printers. Additive save materials, subtractive generates waste, additive saves time. You get what I'm saying? You can throw any words into that sentence. And it, it seems to be a game changer for those of us doing engineering. Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, I, I actually even heard this from a gentleman I was talking to. They. Uh, they used added manufacturing to uh, print a new radar dome for a uh, Navy ship, and they saved 60% of weight off the off the uh, the component by using added manufacturing. And uh, you know, a lot of people forget that that's going to be uh, be most beneficial long term as well, not just for uh, you know reducing uh, cost for extra raw materials, but also reducing time and allowing uh, you know uh, efficient workflow as well. So. Um, the you you met we we mentioned embedded circuits before and this is something that Cooperus is real excited about um, so uh, I'd love to have you jump a little more in detail on embedded circuits please okay yeah sure thing Ian so looking more closely at the fundamentals associated with say a simple circuit card application say I want to have a component with a simple fan out trace pattern so I can plug in a connector and maybe some wires that go to some external instrumentation. So let's go ahead and focus on what that minimum design requirements are. So we've got dielectric spacing, you have conductor geometries. Those will dictate what your current handling capabilities are, your power limits, and the viability of high-speed signals. Okay, so effectively, if you just look at those few elements there, you can essentially come to a replacement for copper foils, which 
copper clad FR4. That's really all it is. The circuit board is a lot of stacked up layers of copper clad FR4. Okay, some are thinner, some are thicker. Sometimes there's more copper, but it's largely just the same thing. So current carrying capabilities are analogous to that copper foil for the power handling. And it's an ability to more easily make a ground plane for reducing interference. So instead of hoping that, you know, an additional cost to add in some more copper and an additional layer to achieve that, you know, layer of copper, you could just add in, you know, electromagnetic interference shielding wherever you actually need it after doing your simulation. And we're doing that anyway, right? So this also allows you to have tunable materials with great signal integrity, controlled impedance lines, which could be different lengths. So that's an impossible achievement there. You're looking at, say for instance, a memory component, all your data lines in current technology need to be the same length because they need to be the same impedance. But if you wanna reduce the size of your card, you could reduce some of the lengths of those lines and adjust the impedance. And then you achieve the same thing. It's the same goal on the system level. The implementation is grossly different, though, and up until now, not achievable. So, it, it largely, let me go into a little bit of a process then here, which would be we'd perform an initial characterization of the material. Uh, we can make then make some trade offs to optimize our process for the specific object that we intend to print. Uh, in this case, we'd be doing a circuit. We would know what we expect those properties to be. And then with most additive manufacturing workflows, there's a few knobs that we turn with the print itself. So we pick the filament out of our toolbox. You know, if we have a two uh, independent extruders on our printer, we'd put in our substrate material. That's your dielectric. We'd put in our, you know, our copper material. That's where you guys come in. Uh, we'd pick our circuit element. And a lot of that stuff comes from an easy drag and drop toolbox nowadays, regardless of who your vendor for software is. You choose your layer thickness within your tool. You can put that information into the slicer settings. And from what I've been talking to you guys about, I can just use the ones that I'm familiar with. There's no even special software to utilize it. And we choose a different nozzle if we really have to. I mean, that's your printing aperture. And then we hit go and I come back later. So that sure as heck beats waiting three to four weeks on a, you know, an outsource that may or may not be domestic because we can't control what the vendors have in their, their wheelhouses. And at this point, if we can bring it in-house, uh, we will, because it's all about America makes right now. And it should be. Yeah, that's one of the uh, driving points of uh, Cooper's vision for the long-term futures. Uh, we really want to uh, assist with uh, bringing advanced and additive manufacturing back to the, the breadbasket of America. We uh, The last 40 years, we've done a great disservice to middle America by, uh, you know, pushing out all these jobs and manufacturing capabilities out of the United States. And as COVID has uh, shown to us and the supply chain issues have continued to show us that, uh, you know, there's certain materials, certain processes, certain manufacturing that we should have in our own country, just so that we're not uh, forced to rely on, you know, uh, you know, asking very politely to countries that may not have our best interests in heart mm -hmm. for, for these materials that we need. So, um, but uh, we talking about copper, you know, uh, we also know that there's unique problems with, uh, you know, traditional solders and uh, other types of materials and aerospace applications. And, uh, you know, Kubros, we're a copper tin uh, filament that has a, uh, our proprietary additive, but uh, tin, tin has unique problems in aerospace. Can you speak a little bit about that, Ed? Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about it. I don't want to go into too much of the, the, mm -hmm. the physical phenomenon, uh, you know, information and stuff like that. But I uh, typically with tin, there, there's issues across industry as we transition away from lead solder through the reach and the Rojas compliance uh, globally. Uh, what we've ended up with is a, a lot of tin and, and tin with certain surface finishes under different types of stresses grows its own whiskers. So it will actually extrude a, a conductive spike or a, a filament from itself, which in electronics, that's very awful. You'll end up with electro, uh, electrical shorts between component leads or from different components. Uh, there was issues with, uh, there was a Toyota issue years ago that had a tin whiskers issue. Uh, Personally, when I've done consulting in the past, we had a lot of our clientele have different tin whisker issues. 
and it's largely a problem in aerospace. Uh, TIN is usually uh, going through extra process steps for qualification to make sure that the, the plating is not too thick, make sure the interface alloys are correct in order to mitigate this effect because it's really bad. So from what, what I've heard from uh, talking to, uh, to your guys' as inventor and what I know about the, the tech from my research over the years uh, has been that tin whiskers isn't a problem with it. So that, yeah. that alone excites me. So yeah. it really comes down to you know, porosity and surface finish. And if that's all dialed in, then you know, sign me up it, it is how I see it. Because if, if we don't have to deal with uh, tin whisker issues because it's uh, muted by the formula, then I think that alone is a good selling point. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, the tin whisker. And although I do uh, uh, appreciate my own whiskers, um, you know, it, it definitely can cause some complications in, uh, especially in space, like we mentioned. And that's why uh, Kubros, uh, one of the fir first formulas we'll be releasing after CU29 is going to be an aerospace formula that specifically mitigates the tin whisker and effects that have uh, have occurred in uh, the vacuum of space and coldness of space. So. Um, yeah, we're definitely excited about that. Um, so we're getting at the end of our time, but uh, there's a few, just a couple more questions. Uh, we're ta we've talked about uh, radiation shielding as well between the two of us um, and, you know, the different forms of um, of Kubros's formulas that uh, are going to be beneficial. Uh, so uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, the, the radiation shielding effect uh, and then jump into CubeSats because that's, uh, that's an exciting uh groundbreaking process uh, that's currently going on. Uh, you know, so they're smaller and smaller. You're able to put more and more on a rocket and get more data and science uh, conducted. So uh, please. <laughs> yeah. So I'll definitely talk about that a little bit. So uh, one of the things we do at NASA and in the space community is uh, radiation effects testing, just so we know our electronics will survive from particle strikes up in space. Uh, so we are we have our trapped radiation belts. There's a lot of protons, there's electrons, there's heavier ions that come in from the sun and from far off in the galaxy that are just flying through space. These particles are very small, can't see them with the naked eye, but we know they're there. We know they've damaged our electronics up there. Uh, some things that are not hardened uh, fail faster than others. You know, space weather is a real thing. Uh, I've got a lot of colleagues at NASA who have done a number of presentations over the years, and some of them are, are more experts in that field. Uh, but for radiation effects, what we're looking for is uh, ways to shield our electronics. So when the particle strikes do occur, that the shielding itself within the within our our, our box or our satellite uh, allows us to either mitigate some of the dosing effects or mitigate some of the particles that are coming through. Uh, by absorbing them or by uh, repelling them in other directions. So we call that spallation. Uh, just another uh, a fun term there. Um, but kind of along those lines, uh, being able to dope metal and use that with semiconductor devices will push back uh, the lifetimes of those devices within space environments. Uh, so in other words, uh, different alloys. I'm not, not going to go too much into the uh, the technology behind it and what you guys may or may not be doing. Uh, but uh, the, the thought in general is, as you mentioned, CubeSats. Uh, we focus on size, weight, and power. We know that we have a certain power envelope, and then we have to figure out what instrumentation in science we're able to achieve within the battery we have. And then we also need control systems, communication systems. If there's a propellant involved, we, we need a flight system for that as well. Uh, maybe navigation. Sometimes satellites talk to each other, so you'd need those antennas as well. Larger ones have solar panels. So the problem becomes if we just buy components like we have been doing, building up large circuit cards, then even within a small form factor device, we are unable to achieve great science or the best science we could because of the limitations of, of what would be today or yesterday's technology. Now, if you focus on, if we can build a circuit card with additive manufacturing and we can control impedance, well, what else could we do with that? Well, we'd be able to do conductives, passive components, jumpers, sensors, and some basic instrumentation. 
we'd almost be able to do all layers of extraction from the component to the card. And then, you know, as we see in the news, and I know we're, neither one of us is working on building rocket engines, but folks are printing rocket engines. Folks are printing vehicle structures. So you know, houses made of cement or maybe a space vehicle body, you know, made out of some type of metallic alloy. And then some folks are even working on solid state propellants that are 3D printed. So I think that's cool to be able to potentially have one machine or a handful of machines in the automated flow fully build up a product with limited human intervention along the way because it's a well-qualified process, you know, by the folks putting it together. So, and, you know, uh, you know, Cube, CubeSats being that fantastic example is a great way to demonstrate these capabilities. So if you can save on size, things you're putting in there, and you can definitely say, save on weight, which use case after use case has shown, you cut something away that's bulk material versus just put in the material that you need, that it's savings right there. And once you've dialed in both of those, then you have more power to work with and more space to put fun stuff. So I'd say that's a success in my book. So additive manufacturing allows us to think about the path we will take to reach our intended goal. Anything that can save on size and weight on subcomponents greatly improves our chances for mission success. You know, I think that that should sum it up in a nutshell without going into too much of our, uh, our physics jargon. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Uh, while I do enjoy high, uh, highly detailed conversations uh for our audience uh we just keep it high level for now to, uh, to save some time um thank you ed uh again for getting on this webinar and talking to me uh, thank you again for coming back and re-recording it since we had a, yeah. a mistake with the video um but please uh can you tell everybody where they can find you and how to get in touch with you <laughs> so most folks can find me on linkedin I'm sure Ian will put up uh, how to spell my last name up with this uh, webinar and, and the information there. Uh, otherwise, you can find us on our website, uh, which is uh, preparedforflight.com or in shorthand, P, the number four, flight.com. And we've had some information about our manufacturing collective, a handful of the brands that we've launched. Uh, we are a venture studio. So a handful of entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, who do internal R&D, and we're setting up a, a framework for domestic manufacturing. So trying to bring back some uh, workforce development, bring back some uh, you know, tricks of the trade to benefit the economy here it is our vision in the long run. It seems like Kubros and Prepare for Flight have a vision that's very much in line together. So uh, definitely interested in seeing where we both go as we progress. Um, so I, I do know, uh, I want to give you guys kudos. I do know, Ed, that you were uh, part of a added manufacturing um, initiative to try to print uh, necessary supplies during the height of COVID. So uh, if you want to mention briefly about that, I'd, I'd love to give recognition where recognitions do as well. Okay, thank you, Ian. Yes, uh, uh, it was requested of us through a uh, nonprofit group out of Washington, D.C., Nation of Makers. You guys can reach them at nationofmakers.com, uh, I believe. Um, and what we've done is uh, we were working with a lot of maker spaces on the East Coast from Virginia all the way up to the, the Pennsylvania region. And there was a request that came in from the emergency uh, personnel within the Washington, D.C. area, as well as some of the hospitals down there, notably uh, Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Facility. And uh, essentially, they were trying to buy components that were very closely backordered everywhere in order to adapt a number of their different filter components, so CPAPs and things like that, in order to retrofit their equipment to use all these different types of filters with incubation tents or on their ambulances and, and things of that nature. So uh, a few of our makerspaces got together and prepared for flight joined in. And at, as orders came in, we were largely running all of our printers 24 seven for a few months straight in order to fulfill a lot of these orders. And a uh, few folks had handed us uh, donations. We actually still have a donation tab up, up on our website uh, to procure some material. And we were just putting together our time and our equipment in order to get these parts and these uh, PPE items into the hands of the people that actually need them. We weren't selling them. We weren't asking for donations back. 
it was uh, significantly important to make sure that they have what they need so they can help the rest of us. So uh, we did over a thousand pieces of PPE, I, I believe, in those three or four months. And then as the larger businesses in the U.S. who don't really have manufacturing capabilities here, they were able to finally green light some of their local partners to have them then use more of the higher throughput equipment to then join the fight to produce some of this equipment. So folks with laser engravers or injection motors and things like that. So as we mentioned with that cutting lead times, they still had to do the tooling to cut out the molds. With 3D printing, we literally pulled in a design file or made one ourselves and started printing. So you're talking about uh, rapid response, rapid deployment of technology and skilled people who were willing to help. And we were all volunteers. And I'd call that a success, working together and maybe saving the day. I wasn't running around trying to do medical things. I'm just an engineer, but the people that were able to did, and we all worked together to make sure that could happen. Yeah, and then that just showcases uh, additive manufacturing with 3D printing and shows how versatile and efficient it is and uh, how it's really going to change a lot of manufacturing in the near term. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a great uh, innovation and technological wave of the industry right now com currently. And we have a lot of new technologies, uh, you know, from cuproses to stuff that uh, I know you have in the works. Well, we'll, we'll wait until a later date mm -hmm. to talk about that. So, uh, and that'll be an excited announcement as well. So, uh, but thanks again, Ed, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, uh, please uh, reach out to Ed at P4, the number four, f.com or prepared for flight as uh, in uh, as well as linkedin and we'll have his name uh, the correct spelling of his name uh, as well on on one of our uh, one of our files so uh, thank you again ed and i appreciate it you're very welcome and thanks for having me <laughs>